Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here one more time, Stratford, Ontario, Canada, for String Tag Workstations. We have another Les Paul in with one of these uh, contraptions on the headstock. Well, that's coming off first thing, and uh, I'm sure it's just one more Gibson guy desperately trying to tune his guitar. Well, we'll get this back to original compensated nut, of course, and it needs a fret dress at the neck junction, and we'll do the proverbial tuning test at the end, and you can be the judge. Okay, first things first, we'll get this thing out of here. Oh, he looks like he's got some fancy tuners on here, locking tuners. Another attempt at trying to stabilize the tuning. Well, your tuning problems will be over forever. Get this off and get a compensated nut on here. And now, hopefully, there's no damage to the headstock uh, with this uh, roller contraction. So let's inspect that first. Well, uh, there was no real need to change the tuners, but uh, it's been done now, so we'll go with it. Nothing wrong with these locking tuners. Completely unnecessary, but uh, so hopefully we don't get any marking from this uh, roller contraption. Let's see. Nope, never left to scratch. That's one good thing about this design. We'll remove that. Check these while we're at it. Very easy to strip these, not too tight. Always a good idea to have a, a bunch of Ziploc baggies so that uh, you don't drop one of those screws and watch it bounce off into infinity. Let's check this truss rod. First and foremost, looking good. Let's check the lay of that neck. Yeah, that's good. Functioning like it should. Okay, let's heat up that nut.
Well, before I go over exactly what I did, let's do our tuning test. These are the elixir strings that Kyle uses, E-flat tuning. Well, let's start with the bridge. So these were the tailpiece lugs that were in there. The bottom cuff was cut off both of these. Now if you remember, this bridge was wrap around. The strings were fed in this way and they wrapped around. Everybody knows about that. And then these little washers, like somebody went to a lot of trouble to do this, they basically sat on the top of the female insert and then the tailpiece was tightened right down so it didn't budge. I think the principle behind that is good, but the problem is this particular guitar and this particular neck set did not lend itself to wrap around. Now I know there's lots of people using wrap around, some pretty famous ones, namely uh, Joe Bonamassa, but you don't just arbitrarily switch to a wrap around. My criteria for wrap around or not is the amount of downward pressure that we create at the focal point on the saddle. This guitar had serious tuning problems and with the wrap around the pitch of the string was reduced such that it was loose and kind of slopping around at the focal point on the saddle. It was causing part of the tuning issue. There's more to come but I just want to cover that first. The threads for the Gibson are much finer than Epiphone, but I had a set of old lugs from, from I don't know where, it was in my junk box, but I, I used that to bring these strings down. Now they look like they're touching, but they're not. All right, There is clearance, even that first string. They do not deflect off the back of the casting of the bridge. Now the focal point on each string is good and tight and this definitely went a long way towards stabilizing and regulating the intonation end to end as you just saw with the tuner tuner doesn't lie one last thing i did want to mention that the bridge itself there's no slop in that bridge it's good and solid so now this end of the scale is taken care of so let's go to the other end of the scale now as you saw at the beginning of the video that uh, roller contraption that was on there, I took off, and it did nothing to help stabilize the tuning. This guy is just one more frustrated Gibson Les Ball owner that could not keep this thing in tune. Now, if you take a second and look at that original Gibson nut, you can see that there's definitely a lot more surface contact. Slots are deeper, greater chance of binding, and you can see that they put a little bit of a taper on these two inside strings to guide them towards their designated posts. Let me bring you in for a good close look at this new nut. Okay, first of all, instead of the injection molded plastic that Gibson use, this is Corian, a much harder material. Less likely for the string to bind. That binding issue is reduced even further because the actual amount of contact area is next to nothing compared to these slots. I also, even on that small contact area, I went out of my way to file on a slight angle 
to guide each of those strings to their designated posts. And of course, each string is in a slightly different spot, just like it is on the bridge. The nut is intonated just like the bridge is intonated. Lastly, we have just enough clearance, as you saw when I did the tuning check, that the open string and the first fret note are all in tune, all the way across all six strings. As always, the real test is to go into the studio, plug it in, play some chords, and let you really hear this thing. But I wanted to go through that first. And the other thing was, we took the locking tuners off and put the original tuners back on. So we're basically back to original, except the nut. And those tailpiece studs, as I mentioned, I just happen to have some in my junk box. So for Kyle, it's a no-brainer. He doesn't need to come back and see me to change that. He can just order the new parts, swap them out, and he's done. Just before I go into the house, I wanted to bring you in to show you Friday is shop cleanup day for me. For all of the latest tech deck guys that have jumped on board over the course of this COVID madness, this is how I am set up. I have shown it before, but I just want to bring you in again. So I basically empty the tech decks, pull out all the tools, vacuum it, and then reload for this coming week. In this unit here, I've got a little over 250 different items, potentiometers and switches and screws underneath the body platform. On this side, I've got my little micro chisels, my luthier's knife, little short stubby screwdrivers, Phillips and straight, some more Allen keys on that front trough, my nut drivers. In the corner here I've got my micro files for filing out nut slots as you saw in this video. And on the right hand side of the double neck support platforms I have this other chunk of high density foam where I've got my chisels, Hosco nut files, some more screwdrivers, dental picks, and some long Allen keys, the one I use for uh, the Martin guitars. And then these three containers that are filled with pencils and Sharpies and flip open razor knives, self-adjusting radius gauges for strats and tellies, etc. On this 24 by 45 inch bench, I got a little better than 350 tools ready to snap up at a moment's notice. The other tech deck is a similar thing. Let me bring you over and show you. Got that little Mustang base I'm going to set up in the morning. So on this one, very similar. I've got, you know, all my Allen keys at the front here. And uh, chisels and files and screwdrivers and another set of Hosco files. And then along the length of this tech deck, loaded into the foam underneath the body platform, I have a selection of screwdrivers and miniature drill bits. You can see my vernier caliper underneath there and my bridge pin reamer in the corner. And underneath you can see my fret file and that is the telescopic mirror just on the other side of the fret file tucked into the foam. And the trough on this end, similar to the other one, I've got my little miniature Allen keys that are used primarily for adjusting electric guitar bridges. Underneath the body platform on this side I've got all my various straight edges, my sanding blocks, so in this little container at the front, let me explain what I got here. These are, I just clip them all together, they're scoop up sticks for glue. These are various radius gauges, Gibson, Martin, Fender, etc. These are the convex radius gauges, I'll use those for checking the shelf, and again there's a bunch of different ones. So this is a disassembled feeler gauge set, I use those for various purposes. We've got a couple of self-adjusting uh, radius gauges here. And then a bunch of razor blades. And that's, that's kind of it for this little container. Saturday mornings tend to be kind of busy because I got all my out-of-town customers that are driving up from Toronto or Niagara Falls or Peterborough or wherever. I like to get things organized on Friday so I'm ready for the coming week and ready for Saturday morning. Each bench is about 3.3 square feet. So I've got a total of 6.6 .6 square feet. And that concludes my Friday afternoon shop tour. We're going to bring that Les Paul in, plug it in and really have a listen. The bandsaw, the drill press, in this case the drill press with the disc sander, the stationary disc sander, and my sneak away 
disk sander and buffer are all driven by an air switch. All four of those machines, the sander, the vertical stationary disk sander, the drill press, the band saw, and this tool as well are all driven with a foot switch. A momentary foot switch or step on it, it's on, release, it's off. And I cannot stress enough about how efficient it is to hold a small piece and it's like sanding on steroids. Those momentary foot switches, I got four of them, I can't even begin to think of how many times a day I use them. Okay, well I'm going to pack up, get ready for the morning. We'll plug in that Les Paul, let you hear that. So this is the progression I've looped. <laughs> 